were soon on the on the world scene um, at a young age. Just a couple of things. The name Crafty Cockney came from a pub in Santa Monica. Yeah, when we used to do the three week tour of America, which was great, great for all the lads. We used to have party time. It was part. Everybody used to go over there, but 30, 40 of us from Britain all come back with more money than we went with and see America. It was brilliant. But in uh, Santa Monica, where we played the first open tournament, there was a pub. There was an English guy who owned a pub, and it was called the Crafty Cockney. And uh, Les, his name was. And he owned three or four delicatessens as well. And he was a multi, multi millionaire. And uh, he had a pub at the top of Hollywood. And we used to have a party up there. And he'd say, That's like Madonna's house down there. And he's <coughs> the top of the hill, you know what I mean? He used to have all the dark boys there. And so, and all the dark bars in America had shirts, you know. So uh, obviously, we all bought Crafty Cockney shirts. And when I come home, I wore it on TV. It seemed all right, didn't it? London boy, Crafty Cockney, it's a nice little nickname, and it stuck, you know what I mean? So it was, it was good. Was it Tom Jones? Tom Jones, Engelbert? Did they go they in? They used to go there. It was, it was an yeah. English pub in, in yeah. the, the middle of Santa Monica. You go in there Sunday afternoon and have roast beef in Yorkshire pudding in the middle of America. It was great. Fish and chips. It was a, a proper, and a proper dart pub as well. I mean, it's about ten dart balls in. Now, put put your hand up to the stance that you used to show. No, like. the finger sticking yeah. there. Now, that, did you work on that? Was that part of the... The do or well, what? The easy way to explain it, my I hold a dart like that and it, c it comes across there. So I'm put the point is there. So yeah. that finger is never going to get to the end of the point. So it's never right. used. It just stuck out. And George said yeah. you would never be a dart. My father said, yeah, Dad! When I used to practice in the, in, in, uh, in the bedroom, because he bought me a dart when I was younger, and I used to practice it. He said, You'll never make a dart player playing like that. You know what I mean? And I'll still have a bit of fun with him. And he said, I'm not taking you down the pub playing like that either. You know? <laughs> but at 14, he took me down the pub and he used to play for a tanner a game on a Sunday morning. Sixpence, you remember what sixpence yeah. was, anyway. And we went down there one Sunday morning, he said, right, you're ready now. I said, ready for what, Dad? He said, I'm going to take you down the pub. And you get in there at quarter to twelve, it, it didn't open till twelve, it twelve till two, Sunday afternoon. Dinner was ready at half two, same old thing. Go in there, I played my dad first, because he put your name up and chalk next. And he just let me win anyway, and a bloke who chalked, I'd play him, and you play sixpence again. And, I, and I, I was on there from like ten to twelve till quarter past two. Pocket full of sixpences, and that was it. And after I beat me dad, there was another five or six names up on the board, waiting, you know, put their names up to play. And he didn't put his name up. And I thought, I, 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 I thought why didn't he put your name up, dad? And he's just like, I, I think he thought I was going to do all right, like, you know what I mean? And he just sat there and watched all day. But he had massive support from his mum as well, because his mum once handbagged me. She, <laughs> Did she? We, we dispute how hard she handbagged. She was dressed like the star from Chicago for Eric's big match this night. Now, I've been sitting there on the telly the night before saying, there's one man in the world that he's scared of, that little Scott, Jockey Wilson. Take it from me, Eric will be in bed now, opening the wardrobes, looking for a jockey, because he's frightened of him. Next night, walk in, and Pam, his mum, stood there, and she had this little black hat and a little bit of a veil on it, she went up. You have insulted my boy. My Eric is scared of no man. And she handbagged me. Yeah, so she should do and all. You know what I mean? Not only did he have a dad who was a brilliant dead card and uh, dominoes, who taught him how to count from the age of 11, and they never got to sleep for four years because he's in the next door room, boom, treble nine means <laughs> that he had massive family support as well from mum and dad. And I think that, that dual edge that he could count better than anybody still probably is, what? Mm. Best candle has ever been? Yeah, I was the only child and all that does help, I suppose. They can spend yeah, more yeah, time. Yeah, if somebody, yeah. somebody's got like five kids, they can't spend the time with them. My, my father always says somebody's good at something. It's just trying to find out what it is. So enter this rookie player, really. Qualifier. Keith, you qualified for the 83 final. And you were, you, you were to become the youngest holder of the world title and the first qualifier to do it. How confident were you that you would make progress um, or the dramatic progress that was ahead when you entered that world title? Well, the thing is, I did win the Los Angeles Open, which was the way I got the chance to get the playoffs, because the BDO brought in a playoff system for the first year where there was four qualified places, because normally the, it was everyone was picked by then. And, I mean, I beat John Lowe, Bobby George, Bob Anderson, on the way to winning the Los Angeles Open. So, and I was playing for London at the time, um, and we were playing with like, Eric and Cliff, I was playing with the best county, so I'd done The Apprentice. I mean, I played Eric when I was about 18, and he came to Ipswich, and I played him best of five, thousand and one, and I beat Eric 3-2. And then Eric got on the mic and said, Lightning never strikes twice, and I did it again. And I think, by, even at that age, I think that gave me a lot of confidence, and I was confident. I mean, I felt that I had a good chance um, of winning if I could hold me bottle, really, because I wasn't sure of TV. I've never been on TV before. And... 
when I went to the playoffs, I absolutely destroyed the players and I played really well. And um, when I got there, um, Peter Purvis was the presenter and he said, I hear you're a good, um, good player, good qualifier. I said, I'm better than that, I'm world champion at the end of the week. And he actually had £20 on me at 66 to 1. So I was confident. I knew that, um, you know, because I'd beaten John Lowe before, so I was confident. And once I played the first two games, I didn't really feel nervous. Maybe because um, no one expected me to do that well. And if I didn't win, I just wanted to get to the quarterfinals because at that time, Eric, you qualified for the next year. That's right. Guarantee, so, it guarantees you to get better last year. So people on TV at that time thought, who's Keith Dennis? Like the first time on, on, on TV. But he'd been on the circuit for like two or three years. So we all knew who he was. And there's, there's loads of good players that never, never make it to TV. And as you say, he won LA Open. Been on the three week tour of us in America, won loads of money over there. So, uh, so he had the respect from the players, but it was a big shock for people at home who never knew who he was. And, and then he, he went on to have a distinguished international career, then as well. And there, that was where the fun really started when England particularly played Scotland. In Scotland. Oh, yeah, brilliant. There was all sorts when they were throwing cans and they were full cans. Coming back to the 83 final. There was somebody else betting on you each round, wasn't there? Yeah. A certain uh, Mr. Bristow Senior, yes. Uh, <laughs> George. Well, I didn't really know because um, there was two um, rooms. One would blow. We always were trying to get in this room where there's all the bands, where there's all their stuff. Band room. Uh, yeah, the band room. It was one dartboard and there was two of dartboards in another room. So when I played um, Nicky Vrashkel, number seven, George came in about 15 minutes before and didn't say a lot. He just said, how are you, Keith? I went, all right, George. How do you feel? I went, Phew. I said, I don't lose against Americans, foreigners. You're having a laugh. So off he went. I, had a, I didn't know he'd had a bet until well, Eric told me that later on. And then I had Les Cable, who was a Stoke lad, and I was just about favourite. And how do you feel? I said, yeah, I'm ready for Mr Lowe. And then obviously that was the big game when I played John. And I was just so excited. I couldn't wait to play. I think that was the difference. Maybe I could have looked at it the other way and thought, oh, my God, I'm playing the, the number three in the world. I, I just couldn't wait to get up there and play. And I think that was the, the good thing for me all week. And uh, George came in. I said... Here comes the first upset, George. I said, I'm playing your boy in the final. And that's what, uh, that's what I was like. And I didn't know that he, each time he was going off having a bet on me. And, uh, he did, yeah. He won a lot of money on Keith. Though. But you did ask him yeah. in the final, didn't yeah. you? He well, says, uh, I said, he might have a bet on him in the final. I'm going to beat him anyway. But he, he never know, do you? But he wouldn't have a bet against his son. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> fair enough. But he, uh, as I say, when he come through that year, so there's, there's certain players that have won the World Championship. I've uh, had a bit of luck where it's just fell right for him and good players haven't played well. We had one a couple of years ago where Taylor wasn't playing well at our World Championship and whatever and John Park won it. You know, all the good players they just didn't play well That When he come through and won it, all right, even, even though he had Nicky Varashko and Les Cape were the first two rounds, then the next three he beat were all world champions, so he didn't come through the back door. You know what I mean? He, he, he earned his right, you know what I mean? So, Well, let's go to that quarter-final, Sid. John Lowe. Number three in the world. Well, he always looked as though it was his by rights. Uh, people always said that Eric was the most arrogant player up on the hockey, but it was partly because he's got the perfect Roman nose, face the good grace and Etruscan coin, <laughs> and with a fag smoke coming out of his nose. I mean, it was in his, his mullet. You know, my streaks here. Streaked mullet. It was. Everybody thought John Lowe was just. Mr. Steady and Real, the diplomat they called him. But I think John was as arrogant in his way as anybody. So, this pale faced kid, you know, was drinking the milk. <laughs> it showed low, by the way, to go home. Because, in a funny way, um, John used to act funny when he was starting to lose a game. He used to sort of suggest it wasn't his night. You know, and I think. They liked seeing world champions beaten by this clean-cut lad who's mum taught him behind the kitchen door when he was making chips. It was a fairy story. You could you could tell when you had Lowe, he's <laughs> flustered, because he's just, he's just uh, sometimes throw free darts quick. You know, he, he's a very steady player, still is, still a brilliant player now. But he's very steady all the time. But once you started being level with him or getting in front of him, then all of a sudden he throw free darts and you think, well, he's trying to change his throw, he's under pressure and whatever else. And just different mannerisms, you know how you got people. And once he started doing that, you think, right, that's it, this will do me. I've got you now, just keep him under pressure. So, uh, but it's, uh, out of all the players that I played against in, in that era, there was only like, I don't know, Keith Beaters and whatever else, but there was two players I was worried about. One was John Lowe, and one, the other one was Jockey Wilson. 
because Jockey Wilson, you just didn't know what he was going to do. No. Jockey Wilson would go up there, go 45, 28, you think, and you go, tell him I'm 40, you think, I've got him here. Yeah? Then you go, 180, 180, yeah, and you think, <laughs> What happened to that link? You know what I mean? <laughs> I was just cruising that one just a minute ago. But that was Jockey. John was a steady one. Jockey was the flamboyant one who, who just didn't know what he was going to do. Jockey won a bottle, was he? Didn't bother, but, never bothered Jockey playing. And how he jumped with that last start. That's that yeah, was right, me laugh. Yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd go up there and he'd, he'd stand behind him. I wouldn't look if he, if he wanted to say double top. He'd go, something, something, he wants double top. And I'd watch his body and he'd go, mm. <laughs> like that. And I'd think, right, I want 82 or something. I'd think, right, 82. And you'd hear, game, shot. And you think, well, how the hell is that going? You know, you look up there, it's right in the middle of the double top. But you look at his body, he just likes to pull his arm off. But, you know, that's, well, nobody could throw like Jockey, could they? What was your reaction to beating John, though? Now, you were confident, you've already said that, but here you are playing one of the big, big names. I just thought, it's, you know, it was a massive game for me. It was um, the game a lot of people thought I was going to lose. And, obviously, the next night I was back on again against Jockey, defending champion. So... I'd, as soon as that was gone, I was just waiting to play jockey, and you know, all I wanted to do was get in the final and play Eric because you know it can't get any bigger than that. Loser.